Hi, I'm Jenny Shampo, the director of the Book of Mormon Art Catalog, and today we're joined by Christine Haglin. Welcome. Thanks. Nice to be with you. Christine is a scholar of Mormon studies. She's the former editor of Dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought, and she's the author of the book of <laughs> Eugene England, a Mormon liberal, which is part of the uh, Introductions to Mormon Thought series published by the University of Illinois Press. And um, she's also currently a PhD student in American Studies at St. Louis University. Um, she's just a real expert on so many things, and we're delighted to have her join us to talk about art and scripture today. The scriptures we're looking at are Alma um, 43 to 52. And uh, the piece we picked is um, actually a photograph by Mandy Jane Williams, um, who's an artist who does a lot of um, images of women in the Book of Mormon. And this piece is called Morianton's Maidservant. Uh, Christine, this image is just so striking and honestly kind of startling when, when you first see it. Can you start by just describing the image and what you see going on here? Sure. Um, so, you know, we have this, this beautiful woman who clearly has been beaten up um, and that is the arresting um, feature. And then you start to look and she's holding a torch. She's in the she's almost in exactly the same pose as like the young women's medallion. <laughs> like, you know, right. it really reminds me of that. Um, it, you know, except that she has this horrible black eye. And then she's also wearing a red robe, which we often associate with Jesus in, in art. Um, so she's, uh, there's a lot going on in a relatively simple and straightforward mm -hmm. image. And then she's, in nature and and so you you get the idea that the torch might be a wayfinding device as well as a symbol right yeah yeah and i have to say just her pose with that torch and the way she's clasping her cloak there it reminds me a little bit also of of the statue of liberty <laughs> just mm -hmm. i feel like there's just an echo there of that composition maybe some ideas about um liberty and justice and and steadfastness and um, she has such a, such a strong gaze, um, like her head is held high. She's looking right out at the viewer. Um, even though she's clearly been through some, some difficult things. Now, Morianton's maidservant is a, a fairly minor character in the Book of Mormon. We just read about her, I think, and it's just one verse that talks about her. Um, so I, I noticed she isn't even in the, um, so let's see what's it's an Alma 50 that she appears. Mm -hmm. um, she doesn't even make it into the chapter heading yeah. <laughs> of Alma 50. So you have to know where to find her. Yeah. Um, so in verse Alma 50, verse 30 and 31. Okay. So she gets two verses. Um, yeah. Do you, do you have those there? Do you, yeah. you read those? Sure. It says, and behold, they would have carried out this plan. That is um, the, the followers of Morianton who are, um, dissenters from the Nephites and trying to go away northward. Um, it says uh, they would have carried out this plan into effect, which would have been a cause to have been lamented. But behold, Morianton being a man of much passion, therefore he was angry with one of his maidservants and he fell upon her and beat her much. And it came to pass that she fled and came over to the camp of Moroni and told Moroni all things concerning the matter and also concerning their intentions to flee into the land northward. Okay. So she um, it, she becomes a spy, right? She's, um, she, she basically acts as a spy and gives Moroni this information that he needs to quell this descent before they have a chance to go into the north and gather their forces and maybe... Um, come back and attack the rest of the Nephites, which is something that Moroni has a lot of recent experience with. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So she ends up being a real hero here, giving this vital information that helps them in a strategic way to to protect themselves from Morianton's um, group, I guess, of soldiers. Um, and so I, I noticed in the Book of Mormon art catalog, there are only um, 15 images that we've found that we've cataloged of Morianton's maidservant. Um, there are only nine 
uh, you know, of those 15, there are nine unique artists, right? So of all the Book of Mormon artists or LDS artists out there, nine of them have tried to depict Maury Anton's maidservant. Um, why do you think she hasn't been depicted as much as other Book of Mormon figures? And how do you think this work compares to the other 14 that we know of? Yeah, so, I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe because she's a minor character and... Um, you know, by by this point in the war chapters of Alma, I'm I'm pretty tired. <laughs> I'm not necessarily always reading carefully. I mean, I you know, it could be just a matter of of where she comes in the narrative. Um, I also think there's a way that this is not the image of women we're expecting in the scriptures. Um, I, I mean, one of the things that happens more than once in the scriptures is that women try to tell men something and they're not believed. So, so this counters our, our expectation of women as either meek and motherly or as, you know, gossips, you know, when, when Jesus was resurrected and the women went to tell the disciples, they, they thought they were telling idle tales, right? They, they didn't uh, believe them. So this runs against our, all of our expectations about women, I think in the scriptures. Um, so, so maybe that's part of it. Uh, by way of comparison, you could think about Minerva Teichert's painting mm -hmm. of, of Morianton's maidservant, where she appears almost as an angel, right? The, the lighting mm -hmm. around her is such that she seems to be glowing, which also happens in this picture, but her, her feet almost look like they're above the ground in the Teichert. She, she mm -hmm. doesn't, um, you know, she, she doesn't appear like an earthbound figure. And so the, um, there she's highlighted as a messenger, okay. um, it, you know, in the way that we expect angelic mes messengers even. Um, and this is different. Uh, the Williams, I think she's, she's very much earthbound, right? Her physicality is an important mm -hmm. element. So it's not just her message, but it is her as a, as a physical being um, that's emphasized. That's really interesting. I, I feel like also in the Tykert one, um, maybe she, uh, the woman, the Morianton's maidservant is not, or we don't see the marks of a, abuse the same way that she's, she's very, she's a very strong figure and a strong pose, but she's unscathed. And I feel like that's sort of, when I look at the other, um, yeah, there's like one little cut on her arm in one of them, or like a, a tiny little yeah. bit of blood on her cheek or something small. And this really leans into Right. Yeah. So I feel like the other 14, when I looked through them, um, either the the woman, the maidservant is either this kind of fainting maiden falling at the feet of Moroni, you know, desperate for help, but also desperate to offer information. Or she's strong and standing, but unscathed. Um, and I think Williams does something totally different than either of those where we have a woman who's clearly been through hard things, who's been abused, um, yet she's still strong, right? She, I feel like the way she's clasping her cloak is a little bit like a little closed off, like a little protective, like she's a little nervous and yet she's holding that torch and she's looking right out at us. So there's this like duality of, um, like... I mean, maybe like all of us feel in life, right? That we're wounded and yet willing to move forward. And um, we're still here, right? Even though we've been through hard times. Yeah. And she's, I mean, to me, that the expression on her face and her gaze, as you point out, is so direct and so forceful. She's demanding to be taken seriously, yeah. um, just, you know, despite having just experienced um you know, one, one of the things that makes women most powerless in the world. She's, she's yeah. claiming the, the power of her knowledge um, right. and her strength in that picture. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about, I mean, I, I feel like I'm kind of of two minds on this piece because I, um, I think it's a really arresting image and I like that. It's also not a piece that is fun to look at, right. It's, it's uncomfortable and, but I think it does some important work that way by making me uncomfortable as the viewer. Do, I, I worry a little bit that 
I don't know. I that maybe the piece sentimentalizes domestic violence a little bit. I don't know. Do you see any issues here with that? Um, I don't know. I mean, yeah. yes. I mean, I, 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 I see that worry, and and I think that is something we should be thinking about. But, but I also think that our tendency is always to look away um, from victims of domestic violence and. Um, or or to regard them only as victims. And so the duality that you point to in this painting of, you know, being frightened and, and you know, mm -hmm. holding her robe around her, but also demanding that um, people listen to her. Right. Um, but that is, that feels powerful to me. And to me, that feels like um, the, the right, well, a right way to, to, um, to pay attention to um, victims of domestic violence, to see them not only as victims but as as full people, mm -hmm. um, and and so I, I think I think the image does good work in that way, yeah. um, but it is it it is very uncomfortable, mm -hmm. um, and I it, you know I think on the whole the Book of Mormon should be uncomfortable. It, it should make us uncomfortable more often than maybe it does. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard every once in a while in, in Sunday school this year comments about how I always feel peaceful when I read the Book of Mormon. And I think, <laughs> huh. <laughs> you know, like that, of course that happens, right? I mean, there is there is peace in reading the scriptures and and feeling close to God in that way. But the actual text mm -hmm. is quite disturbing on a pretty yeah. regular basis. That's right, exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting, Christine. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any um, final thoughts here on your reaction um, to to this character in the Book of Mormon, these scriptures or, or this artwork? Yeah. Um, as I've as I've thought about this passage and, and this this photograph, um, I've been thinking a lot about minor characters generally. Um, I think when we're younger, at least when I was younger, I would read the Book of Mormon and identify with Nephi or Moroni, and I was going to be the hero of the story. And, um, you know, when you reach solid middle age, you start realizing that, oh, actually, <laughs> you know, it turns out there aren't that many of us who get to be heroes or main characters yeah. of the story. And most of us, most of the time, will be minor characters. Mm -hmm. And, um, but maybe, you know, minor characters through much of our lives. And then suddenly, you know, we have one chance to do something heroic or, or maybe we don't, you know, maybe we just do small kind things throughout our lives and they don't even um, necessarily get recorded. And that realization makes me a little bit more compassionate towards myself, but it also makes me really want to think carefully about how I respond to the people that I meet who, who seem, you know, like minor characters. It, we, you know, we all go through life as though we are the central character of our stories right. and right. other people are, are minor characters. And um, it's reminded me of one of my favorite poems by Gerard Manley Hopkins okay. called The Lantern Out of Doors. I don't know if you know it, but he's he's lamenting that sometimes someone goes by with a lantern. And so this torch made me think of it. And, and the the lantern beams against our our air and we we notice and we pay attention for a moment and then it disappears into the distance. Um, and and we don't ever know what happens to those people. They appear in our lives for a moment and then are gone. And he he concludes by by wondering about them and lamenting his inability to follow their whole story, but mm -hmm. then noting that there is someone who who follows their story and cares about them. So let me just, if it's okay, just read Please. the last. Oh, yes. And, uh, um, he says, death or distance soon consumes them. Wind, what most I may eye after, be in at the end, I cannot. And out of sight is out of mind. Christ minds, Christ's interests, what to avow or amend their eyes them, heart wants, care haunts, foot follows kind, their ransom, their rescue, and first, fast, last friend. 
And I just, I, I love that reminder, both, both that we ought to be gentle and pay as much attention as we can, but then that where our attention and care are limited, that all of the minor characters everywhere are in some, our main, main characters to Jesus. What a beautiful testimony. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm so glad you brought some poetry into this discussion too. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me.